In this episode of the Beta Podcast, I sit down with Simon Miller, the CEO and co-founder of Scalable Capital UK. Scalable Capital is a robo-advisor that provides digital wealth management. The investment platform founded in 2014 now manages over £1 billion in assets for clients. In this podcast, we talk about everything from Simon's early career trading at Barclays to the challenges of running a rapidly growing investment platform. We also touch upon the future of fintech services and Simon's thesis on the disaggregation and reformation of financial services. Okay, welcome back to the Beta Podcast. I am joined with Simon Miller today, uh, the CEO and co-founder of the UK Scalable Capital. Um, and do you want to introduce yourself and a little bit about Scalable, uh, scalable Capital? Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, um, I'm one of the UK co-founders of Scalable Capital. I'm currently CEO of the UK business. Um, scalable Capital is a robo-advisor. Um, what that means is it's a digital wealth manager, an online wealth manager. Mm-hmm. So uh, our clients, anyone who has £10,000 or more, um, in, in the UK, um, can go to our website or via our mobile app, go through a series of questions which establish their suitability for our service, yep. and thereafter they can entrust us with, our, with their money um, and we manage it for them, obviously seeking to maximise their, their long-term wealth. Perfect, and I'll, I'll dive into more about the specifics of Scalable later on, um, but let's turn it back a bit. Uh, the reason I, I met you at Warwick, uh, yeah. you're an ex-Warwick student, um, I met you at a FinTech conference, and this is how we just kind of got this going. And I want to go back to Warwick and even before that, uh, what were your interests growing up? Because you came into Scalable after a career in trading. Mm-hmm. Was this something cultivated at an early age or? Um, I think kind of throughout my career, and like it's still quite a young career, I'm 33 mm. now, um, everything's always been interested by my kind of current interests. So, so throughout school it was, it was maths really was my main subject. Yeah. Um, and a bit of sport on the side, yeah. Um, and then going to Warwick, yeah, like, the, like math was the big drive. I wanted to um, kind of get into the study that I was best, uh, the subject that I was best, yeah. at and one I enjoyed the most. Um, once I got there, kind of realizing that pure maths academia wasn't the direction mm. for me. Like, where did that lead me to? Um, and then it became kind of finance, economics, business. There were the subjects that I branched off within my university degree and started studying. Yeah, and were you allowed, were you allowed that flexibility at university yeah, to kind of explore these I, areas? Well, it's pretty good for that. Yeah. Um, in general, like, I think my last year, less than half of my degree was actually maths. Um, okay, so well, yeah. In terms, of, in terms of the points, the way it was made up. Um, and yeah, that led me to then going, okay, right, well, I, I still like this kind of mathematical foundation, but within finance, um, what careers are there out there? Yeah. Um, and then it was sort of the appeal of something that was fast-paced, kind of exciting, but also built on the fact that I had pretty good numeracy, numeracy skills yeah. um, that led me to a trading job. Um, so I applied for a few internships there and ended up at Barclays Capital, mm-hmm. um, where I'd say pure by, it's by chance the section you end up in because you apply for trading roles in general. Yeah. But I ended up in a, in a base metals trading role, um, which was like really, really exciting for, for the first three, four years. you had. I started on September 2008. Um, which is the, the the month that Lehman's went bust. So, right. So everything was going. Everything was nuts. going on. <laughs> um, we had obviously a, a, a big recession over the course of kind of a year that followed, and then a pretty, uh, what very the most, one of the most significant bull mm. runs we've had in, in, in recent history. Um, all of which kind of yeah was part of my learning curve um, and really really enjoyed. So something I would wanted to ask, and I find this interesting when I talk to people that are in this trading sector. Mm. Uh, were you very good at dealing with the psychological aspects of trading? Because from what I've observed, people, uh, similar to kind of professional poker players, that whether they win or lose, the emotions kind of stick to the same. Did you follow that kind of path or what was the learning curve there? Uh, yeah, interesting. I think different kinds of people can be good at it for different reasons. Um, okay. You have some people who are who, who almost an ignorance is bliss type attitude. You know, yeah. they, they believe their own um, conviction so strongly that they're almost ignorant to, to any other potential mm. outcome. And that can actually give them good confidence within, within a trading circle. But obviously, makes them potentially a bit unaware of the of the risks. Right. Um, so, yeah. I, I was I was definitely more more in the mid, in the middle. I, I was kind of very aware. Um, I think I was very aware of what our advantages were in trading. Mm. And no point did I believe that we as a group of traders, you know, had some um, divine skill or ability to read the markets. I was more aware that at Barclays Capital as a trader, you have a significant amount of flow. What does okay. that flow give you? That flow gives you knowledge about market positioning about the current, you know, the, the trends and the where, you know, if, if, um, if, for example, in, in copper, which we used to trade a lot of, 
And if the Chinese are buying and restocking a lot of stockpiles, mm. you know, there's a lot of demand in the market. That's not something that's going to change overnight. And so you can see a trend that's there over the, the, the weeks that follow. Yeah. And that's not because you're some, some special inter interpreter of the market. It's more yeah. than the seat you're in and the flow you've got. So I was very aware that Barclays was a great place to be for mm. as a trader. I think it's quite different being a out and out, if you like, um, uh, just pure pure risk trader, like a prop trader, proprietary yeah. trader. Um, that's where I think you really have to trust your own convictions, and, and it's almost like playing poker with yourself. Right. right. You don't want to you don't want to feel the emotion of being on the wrong side of a trade because mm. that can force you to make a bad decision. I see. And w when you were trading metals as well, were you trading derivatives of metals? So was it options yeah. trading that you were yeah, trading? Yeah, exactly. So I started on futures, so flat price and forward yeah. trading, um, and then moved on to options. Perfect. I, the, the only reason I bring it up is that I'm doing a derivatives module at the moment. I won't go into detail and pretend that I know uh, the, yeah. the in-depth strategies, but I, I know how complex it can get. And options trading was the bit that was uh, probably I found more exciting because, again, it kind of connected back more to a bit of the mathematics behind it. You, you're mm. not doing maths on a daily basis. But understanding the, the fundamentals underneath option pricing yeah. helps you to understand okay how your position, how your book's going to respond in different market situations. Awesome. Uh, rather than just a flat price moving up and down. I see, yeah. So after so so during your career at Barclays taught you a lot about trading, investing, I see yeah. as well. Um, I want to get onto the stage of how did scalable start to form for you? Yeah, so I think for me, it started with like the change of interest whilst I was at Barclays, right? mm -hmm. partly because this learning curve flattened. So post 2008, maybe by around 2011, 12, yeah. the learning curve for me had kind of had, had flattened quite mm -hmm. considerably. Um, and also that was a quieter period in the markets. Um, and then I think that coupled with the stage you are at your life. So once I hit mid to late 20s, that's probably, if I'm honest, the first times I started thinking about investing. Right, like right, early okay. days, it was about a career, paying off student loans, etc., etc. Then yeah. you start thinking a bit more towards your long term, and that kind of just coincides with okay, well, what am I now interested in? Um, I became more and more interested in, in, in investing as a theme, um, and then it kind of all came together with a slightly fortunate um, uh, kind of uh, meet up, which was with one of my ex colleague uh, ex colleagues from Warwick. Mm -hmm. um, so he studied a guy called Eric Podzivai, who's the co CEO of, our, uh, of Scalable Capital. Um, he studied an MBA at Warwick um, during my second year. Um, became friends, he joined the rugby club and, and that was where we, we first met yeah. um, and stayed in touch ever, ever since. Um, he happened to get in touch with me um, late 2014 um, to talk about, if, if you like, just uh, an idea that him and a couple of his golden colleagues had, had, had yeah. which was to, to look at the fintech space um, and to try and, if you like, not exploit, but try and be part of something which was clearly moving a lot of, yeah. um, moving in the industry. Um, and they'd come up with the idea that wealth management was the place to be. Um, Why do you think he got in contact with you? Um, I think at that stage in start, starting a, like starting a business, like you've got a different pipe of people that you need. You know, if, you, if you're building a tech company like Scale Capital, you've got some obvious hires, you need, you need a CTO, you need something that like a fantastic yeah. uh, engineer to lead your early efforts. Um, other people you need really are, are, are smart people that you trust um, and I think that's what the founding team of Scalable Capital is mm. um, and we weren't a small founding team it was uh, six of us in the end which included a university professor three ex Goldman, Cap uh, Goldman Sachs colleagues one uh, ex McKinsey yeah. consultant and, and myself from Barclays um, well, all of which who I'd say were quite generalists um, obviously with, with small specialities in, in different areas yeah. Um, but yeah he got in touch and, and said look do you, do you want to be part of this and for me it was a really, a really good opportunity to to branch out uh, away from what was a quite focused career in trading mm. metals um, into into something that was kind of new, new and exciting. So, do you think as well having that base, your your co-founder base, that was uh, it propelled you when you were launching? Was it easier to then get people on board and using the product? Well, actually, before I'm jumping ahead, what was your initial product that you were offering with Scalable as well? Yeah, so so day one, the vision with Scalable. Um, was it was always to be a pan-European uh, robo-advisor. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to offer, you know, not necessarily sophisticated, we wanted to, wanted to offer quality investment services yeah. for kind of the every levels. And it's not everyone, but there's a minimum of 10,000, but a significantly larger portion than had access to wealth yeah. management previously. Like wealth management was reserved for people with you know, 200 plus thousand uh, pounds. Right. We wanted to bring that right down, bring fees right down, um, mm. but without sacrificing the quality. That was the that was the vision. That was the, the kind of the early clients that we got. 
um, were those who were looking to solve that problem. They had money to invest, they didn't want to go to a DIY platform and, and make their own decisions. Mm. They wanted someone to do it for them, but they wanted to have a quality service at a low cost um, and with good accessibility. So everything yep. was always delivered via an app, via a website, real-time valuations of your portfolio. If you want to withdraw your money, there's no charge, you can get it back within two days. See, yeah. And that was that. That was the early, the early part of the early vision. And actually, it's interesting uh, you mentioned that because Jack wanted to ask a question. Uh, he wanted to ask, and I've got it here. Um, do you see the next generation, so my generation mm-hmm. and, and younger, um, wanting to prefer more passive investment tools, or do you think that they will want to have a more of an active role in using something like Robinhood, for example? Um, I think we're going to end up falling somewhere in between. Um, but let me let me explain what I mean. Mm-hmm. I think we'll end up with um, with more passive instruments, and um, because in the recognition of a low cost and a broadly diversified portfolio, I think that that is kind of the future of investing. Yeah. But I think where where kind of the active element com- will come in will be with the engagement around it. Okay. Um, I think it's you don't have to make the investing decisions to feel like you have an active involvement with your portfolio. Mm. And that's what we're, we're really trying to strive for now. And I think some of the, the companies who are leading this space are doing, it's involving the investor, the client, as much as they want to in the, in the portfolio, in the decisions yeah. that are being made. Uh, you know, helping them to understand what's underlying the portfolio. So we have a feature in our, in our app where you can see the overall allocation. We mm-hmm. have a nice cool little kind of grid chart and you can see, okay, I've got 40% in equities, like 30% in government bonds. And if you want to drill deeper, you want to know a bit more, you tap on your equities and you go and you suddenly see, okay, which regions am I in? I'm in the US, I'm in emerging markets. Mm-hmm. And if you want to keep drilling, you tap again, you go look deeper and deeper into it and get more understanding and ultimately you can see the under, underlying holdings of what you yeah. have. Um, that for me, I think is, if it's not active investing, you're not making those decisions, but you're engaged with what's going on and I think you have an element of control mm-hmm. um, and a relationship with the, with the provider that didn't exist before. Yeah, so, so you're not completely blind to what's going on, exactly. but you're also, I'm sure it takes a lot of time to adjust and con- continually update because isn't you update the portfolios? Yeah, How often is it? Well, we we, we optimize every oh, single sorry. day. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. update or optimize, but it doesn't mean doesn't mean we change them every day. Right. right okay. We you will review your portfolio on a day and, and say, okay, right now you're still at the right risk level. Yeah. And the right market exposure, um, but typically we see once every two to three weeks there'll be a, an adjustment made. Okay. And to kind of keep your you at your risk level. Perfect. And. So let's move on to scalable now and going forward as well. So, how how big is your team now? What's what's your motivations going forward with scalable? How do you want to grow? So we've now got um, just over ninety people, mm-hmm. um, and that's across. And the majority of those are in our Munich office, um, so we're in Munich and in London. Mm-hmm. Um, we still hold that vision of going pan European uh, as a wealth manager, um, but since day one, we've expanded from being a a D to C, so just a direct to consumer. Um, proposition to looking into the B2B space as well. Okay. Because what we realize that we have as a, as a company is, you know, it's a, a huge engineering team, so 50 plus people of our, of our 90 mm. are software developers. Um, we can now build um, or customize what we have for, for partners. We can white label it or we can build fair services yep. for other people. Um, and that's an avenue that we've really, tried, uh, we've really started to explore. Um, the one, the first, the one of, of real significance that went live was um, ING. Okay. Which is um, the digital bank in, in Germany. Yeah. Um, I think they were around 8 million retail clients. We went into a collaboration with them to provide wealth management services mm. for, their, for their clients. Um, and that's something we're continuing to do in, in, different, in different ways, in different places. And you think that's going to be probably a significant portion of the growth yeah, of the company? Yeah, for, for scale, well, that's, that's around half of the growth of the company now. Okay. Um, and, and I think it will continue to, to grow. Yeah. Um, like we, we still have a very strong focus on the direct business. Um, because that's probably where we're closest to the client. That's yeah. where you make the most learnings, and that's where you make the most product developments because you kind of get as much feedback as you mm. um, as possible. Um, but yeah, that B two B, if you like, angle um, solves probably one of the hardest parts of our business, which is the the, the customer acquisition. Obviously, right. we have a marketing yeah. team and a big marketing budget for our direct proposition. A lot of that is taken away when you partner with someone who already has the clients, and mm. you're just exposing a service to them. Um, which is naturally useful for them. If, if I'm a banking client and then my bank provides to me a, yeah. you know, a really smooth um, investment proposition, then it makes sense for me to use that. Of course. So you kind of cut out that client acquisition cost, which, which is significant. Great. So I've got some more questions here. Let's have a look. Um, ah, yeah, I wanted to ask, um, 
because obviously you've had this numerical background, you've been in trading. How has, how has it been to the transition of being a CEO and what problems as a CEO have you had that you wouldn't have had before just in your trading role? Yeah, um, in, the, in the trading world, it was, it was quite, quite a simple life, if you like. You know, to, yeah. um, and, and also probably by the, by the design of the job as well. Right? It's a market-based job, so you know, arrive at seven, quarter past seven in the morning and you leave pretty much clockwork at six o'clock every evening. Um, once the markets are closed and you've tidied up, um, your yeah. responsibilities are very much your own. Obviously, you, you, know, you, you will have um, some, some, report, some reports into you, but 90% of your time is focused on managing your risk for the, for the bank and, yeah. and, and doing as good a job as you can. Um, when you branch out to that, and even you know, in my early days at Scalable, like, um, sort of before, before I took on the, the UK CEO role, um, you've suddenly got a million things going in different directions. Right? Yeah. And, and also, being in a startup, it's, it's the fact that you have to get your hands dirty with, with anything and everything. Mm. You know, in, in the early days, we involved ourselves with, with a lot of the product and the design stuff. Um, and then something that picks up significantly in a financial service institution is the compliance element. Mm. So you know, I probably spend maybe 15, 20% of my time in a, uh, on an ongoing basis I see, on compliance yeah. roles and compliance tasks, etc. And um, there's ongoing change in regulations um, which you have to stay ahead of and make sure that you're kind of on top of. Yeah. Um, and I don't actually really, and people might think, oh, regulations are, are always getting in people's way. I, I kind of feel the opposite. I don't present them at all. Um, I think it, it gives you a, a validation and a credibility which you need yeah. in financial institutions. You know, no one would ever trust a startup that just said, oh, I'm going to manage your money for you until they knew, okay, this, this mm. company is regulated um, by, by the FCA. Um, they, they go through the same processes and checks and controls that you know, uh, an HSBC, a Barclays would have to yeah. go through, um, and that's that's a good thing. So, so do you work closely with the regulators as well? Is it something, or is it just something you you have to work on the compliance more so for? Um, at our size, you have we kind of get involved in the odd thematic review. Okay. And um, we don't have that much. Um, we're not a big enough institution to have kind of a designated right I see. contact point at, at the regulator. Yeah. Um, but we we work not only obviously internally do we have our own compliance. Um, Function, but we then also have compliance consultants that mm-hmm. help us to stay up to, up to speed with everything that's going on. Perfect. And next question I wanted to ask um, for you with Scalable, why was it the right time to start the company? I think you might have actually covered this already, but <coughs> um, I think I think what worked best with the type of timing here was it's kind of a little bit hinted by what was happening over in the US. So mm-hmm. FinTech is a theme. FinTech's been going on for forever. Yeah. Um, but I think ad- advents in cloud computing, p- a pure compute power and access to that at a lower cost um, enabled companies like ours to, to, to exist and to exist, exist at a big scale. Um, so kind of while we saw the kind of the FinTech um, topic building up again, and you see, you see it in the media, you see it if you look across um, a lot of different spaces, uh, the founders kind of looked across at the US as a, for a hint of direction of where yeah. we were going. And in 2014, those were the early days of two firms in the US called Betterment and Wealth Fund, mm-hmm. um, who are now, I think, 10 billion plus each in assets under management. And the US typically seems to be sort of three to five years ahead of, uh, of, of Europe. Mm. Um, and so kind of we, we took lead from that. We looked around the space and looked at, looked at what, what competition was in, in, the, in Europe. Um, we decided we needed to be pan-European because we needed to emulate the size that you have in the US. Yeah. And by yeah. Being a single country, you wouldn't be that. Um, but yeah, we decided that, that wealth management would be the, the sector to really to really go after, and it went from there. Do you do you look to the US now as well when you're when you're looking at what to go for next as well? Is that still an element of? To agree, I think you always you always look across competitors and, and different markets, mm. um, and yeah, inevitably the the US features heavily in that, um, whether it's kind of the overall direction of firms, whether it's you know, whether it's new areas in fintech that could be useful for our clients, right? And yeah. Like there's there's companies, um, there's a company in the US called Acorns, which yep, yep. This, they were the first to really do this roundup technology where you spend on your card, you get um, you round up your ATP yep. to a pound and yep. that twenty P goes into your to your savings pot. Um, and these are the sort of features that you could think, okay, should we introduce that for our clients? We could mm. easily have that as part of a scalable service. Um, things like that and, and those yeah, looking at looking at if you like um, innovators in different spaces is always going to be helpful, um, and that helps us to form a plan for you know the next five years or so. Cool. Yeah. So the next question I wanted to ask is, where do you see the future of 
retail banking, investing, and I mean, you just need to go on the tube to see Monzo, Starling Bank, all these things pop up. Uh, Cedars for crowdfunding, it's, it's becoming very mainstream. And yeah. where do you see the future of those services going also in relation to the big cor- existing corporates that are there? Yeah, and I, as a side point, I think it's, there's almost a bit of a confusion or choice paralysis starting to come in for, for the consumer, right? Like yeah. The tube's a great example. There's like, you know, in one carriage, there'll be six different financial yeah. companies. Mostly, you know, some will be doing peer-to-peer lending, some will be doing investing. Yeah, it can can create a lot of confusion. Um, like my my view and and, and kind of shared across the firm is, is really that um, I think we've seen a bit of a um, disaggregation of, of financial services, right? Like the breaking apart, which mm. which, is, which is evident with all these different firms providing those different services, whether it's lending, payments, yeah, uh, investing. Um, I think over the next three to five years, we'll start to see the re- aggregation of those, mm. um, of those services. And they can happen, I guess, in two ways. One is the marketplace, so i.e. marketplace platforms which provide you access to all these different individual financial services. Right, I see, yeah. The other is probably more the incumbents, either developing, buying, or integrating with those firms directly themselves. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit more a believer of the, of, of the second option the in the future. Um, just because, uh, yes, there'll, there'll always be early adopters and there's always this opportunity which exists for, mm. for new challenges to, to get to scale because they can innovate faster than they can get that early growth. Um, but ultimately, I think there's enough time, given the size of the incumbents, that they can respond. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not a given by any means, yeah. but if they invest enough into their technology um, and to make the right decisions in terms of partners, etc., they can effectively create the one-stop shop that I think is the solution for everyone in, in five years or so time, five, ten years. Um, and by that one-stop shop, I mean, you know, let's say you, you go to your you go to your bank, and we all use, pretty much everyone uses uh, online banking now, yeah. mobile banking, uh, and within that, you have access to all the other services. Yeah. Um, and obviously, in the ideal world, you don't really have to go and seek them out. In the ideal world, if I'm uh, seeing an excess, or my account's seeing an excess of £300 surplus every month, I should be getting helpful hints about what to do with that. Whether yeah. it's right, you should be filling up a... Uh, and I see you, you, you know, you've got a cash ISA, why don't you put it into a, a stocks and shares ISA? And I think those services, not just in investing, but in, across the financial services spectrum, will start to come into one place. And I think that's what we're already seeing, um, but the execution's only going to get better. And, and hopefully, as these firms mm. invest more technology, they're really becoming up slick. Perhaps it was also a necessary disaggregation to then Absolutely. promote the efficiency in each different element. And then it will come back together, as you were saying, more efficient for the for the end user for every service that you need. Absolutely, like, and and a, a good example of that is is you know, Monzo and uh, and some of the other challenger banks, Starling, etc. They they've pioneered sort of these different features, so mm. being able to freeze your account, being able to to block certain types of of spending. Yeah, uh, and now you're seeing the, the the incumbent banks, you know, emulating the same thing. And I don't think it's a bad thing if you like, for the incumbents to be copying those features because they're helpful features for yeah. someone to have. Um, and that, yeah, it, just, it prompts a reaction from, mm. uh, from the bigger firms, which, yeah, like you said, I think is a necessary, a necessary disaggregation to happen before it could happen. Great. Next, I want to go, before we sort of wrap the thing, these things up, I want to ask, what are some of your personal aspirations and um, this question of what's important to you? Um, yeah, no, this is a really quite really hard question I find. Um, <laughs> so, like I said earlier on, my, my personal kind of like aspirations and focuses have tended to align with interests. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so kind of that's what prompted the investing because that stage of my life I started thinking about it myself. Um, now, I think I've got more flexibility to be able to to choose you know, which areas to go into next. Yeah. Um, I'd like to follow through with scalable and see how how much we can branch out potentially. You know. From investing into into other areas as well, yeah. Um, and beyond that, I think it's probably too hard to say. <laughs> who, who knows? Who knows what will happen in the next five, ten years? I yeah. Think I think t- that fintech as a whole has got a, a huge runway to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just being part of any firm, um, if you like, investing in technology and improving their services will be an exciting thing to do. Whether I get a chance to start another company doing something else, we'll we'll, we'll see as well. And then on a personal level, outside of work, outside of investing. What do you like to get up to in your free time, and you know how does that help you when you come back to work, for example? Yeah, so most of my um, most of my personal interests are, are pretty much things that really engage and focus you in that interest. So taking you kind of completely away from your from the days. Yeah. So I, I still play rugby. Um, I just kind of just came back from a skiing holiday, kind of 
uh, fortunately, and, and, and love those sorts of, sorts of activities because you kind of clear your head, yeah. and re-energize, refocus, spend spend a bit of time with friends, um, and and yeah, come back. That, that this week have come back and been kind of super energized and focused on on, on everything that's going on here, mm. um, just because of that that short break and because that short break was so, if you like, separated from from my day to day. It kind of yeah. enables you to um, to come back with additional momentum. Awesome, great. So we're going to finish up here with some. Quick fire questions, just off the top of your mind. Uh, don't worry if you can't get it straight away. <laughs> um, so the first one is the biggest person who's influenced you. What? <laughs> Martin Johnson. Your favourite music artist at the moment. Um, George Ezra. Good shout. My mum would love him. <laughs> yeah, big fan. That's sign of my age. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could speak to three people, dead or alive. Um. Richard Branson, Elon Musk, mm. Winnie Houston. All, all at once, all around the table. All at the same <laughs> table, very interesting table. Um, short or long Bitcoin? Um, short. Netflix or read? Netflix. Audiobook or real book? Uh, real book. Uh, winter or summer? Winter. And if you could recommend one book for the viewers. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Farm. Perfect. Simon, thank you so much. Thanks.